Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our seven-part Facebook Live series on the Bredesen 7 Key Lifestyle Habits that Support Brain Health. I'm Nikki Wolf, the Director of Education and Social Wellness for Life Seasons, the maker of NeuroQ. We return today to continue our discussion with Dr. Dale Bredesen, this time focusing on brain stimulation. Keeping our brains stimulated and active helps maintain brain function and memory. Certain lifestyle habits, activities, and even some unexpected therapies promote new neural pathways and keep our brains sharp. So again, join me in welcoming Dr. Dale Bredesen in discussing this fascinating topic. Now, for those that haven't tuned in before, Dr. Bredesen is a world-renowned neurologist and pioneer in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. He is the, also the author of two New York Times bestsellers, including The End of Alzheimer's. Currently, he is a professor at UCLA. Dr. Bredesen, thank you so much for joining us. Great talking to you, Nikki. Absolutely. Well, first of all, can you tell us what you mean by brain stimulation? Yeah, that's a really good point. So when you're improving your physique, you may want to be doing some weight training. You may want to be working out. Um, and if you do that workout and you have had no appropriate nutrition, it's not really going to help you. But if you've got appropriate nutrition, you've got best building blocks there, then this is actually going to help you, and it improves your insulin sensitivity, for example. Uh, of course, improves your strength, et cetera, numerous other parameters, and has a positive impact on your cognition. The same sort of thing goes on in your brain. We are stimulating the synaptic function, stimulating neurotransmission. Now, again, you don't want to do this on the backbone of having everything else go wrong. So it's part of an overall program as you're getting yourself into mild ketosis, as you're improving your insulin sensitivity, as you're doing the right things, removing inflammation, one of the things you want to do is to stimulate that brain. And in fact, when you do that, one of the things that happens is it produces the growth factors, things like BDNF and NGF, which are actually helpful. So you're actually doing good things and, and you're synergizing with the other pieces that you're doing. And it turns out that multiple different types of stimulation can be beneficial. And again, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to crash but you want to get some stimulation and then relaxation and then some stimulation and then some relaxation. So this can be stimulation through brain training, can be stimulation through light therapy, can be stimulation through uh, magnetic uh, stimulation, stimulation through microvoltage electricity. Uh, don't, don't fry your brain. You don't want to go too high, but microvoltage or stimulation even through sound and things like that. And then, of course, you get stimulation from things like reading novels and doing crossword puzzles and brain training and all those sorts of things. So some stimulation works together with the other pieces to give you a better neurochemistry and better cognition. Fantastic. So it sounds like it's a balanced approach of stimulating, but allowing time to relax yes. in the body. And that stimulation is kind of, that's what's going to help build the muscles of our brain. Is that, is that right? To some extent, yeah, uh, they're, you know, in this case, uh, synapses instead of and synaptic transmission. But uh, again, it's about giving yourself some degree of stimulation and then relax. Just like with stress, a little bit of short period of stress, then relaxation is fine. Chronic stress, bad. So you don't want that chronic stimulation. You don't want to be things to be on keeping you up all night. You don't want to be driving yourself to the point that you're stressed. This actually should not be stressful. That's an important thing. If you're getting stressed out, take a break. But to have some degree of stimulation, essentially it gives you repetitions, training, practice, and your body responds by improving its overall synaptic architecture. I love so much that we're talking about this. I think this is such a crucial conversation. And, you know, for those of us listening, what are some ways that the average person can incorporate their brain stimulation into their everyday lives? Yeah, for all of us, um, there are some very simple ways to do that. Uh, and one way is just with brain training. And whether you do it, you can do it with... Uh, uh, with Brain HQ, for example, uh, Professor Mike Mersnick, who really is the, is the father of brain training and started this years ago, 
uh, is, is the one who, who founded Posit Science, um, which offers Brain HQ. Uh, there are other ones that are available as well. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the things that you can do uh, for, for, for brain training as well. The only difference is they haven't been published as well. There aren't as many data for some of these others. Uh, but some people like other ones. Um, you know, there are the levels and things like this that, are, that you can do to, to improve. Uh, and so other ways to go, fine. And then, of course, um, again, crossword puzzles, uh, Sudoku. Uh, reading a novel, learning a new language, learning a new instrument. Um, again, don't stress yourself out, but just challenging your brain and, and continuing to, to work with it. It's, you know, one of the interesting things that we see is when people have done something for many years uh, and they're quite good at it, whether it's architecture, uh, playing the piano. We had one patient, for example, who was a concert level pianist. And even in late stage Alzheimer's, uh, with a MOCA mm -hmm. score of zero, when she could not do much of anything else, she could still learn and play new pieces, which was so surprising. So there's no question, the things that you do really help you to continue on those things. So you know, give yourself some challenge. Uh, again, other things like uh, red light stimulation, um, and when you do so-called photobiomodulation, PBM, this is a very common thing and has been shown in numerous studies to be supportive of cognition. The two things that have come out of those studies, number one is about 40 hertz uh, is the, the, the typical. In other words, you want to have a flicker of about 40 hertz. You don't want it to be super fast. You don't want it to be super slow. Uh, and you don't want, if you're going to do more down in the alpha range, 40 is gamma. If you're going to do alpha range, which is more in the 8 to 13 range, you don't want to do it too low because you can actually potentially slow down. If you've got a good, let's say yours is a 10 and you're driving it now at 8, you can actually entrain it to be slower, which you don't want to do. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is uh, is the, the frequency, uh, is the, the wavelength of the light typically around what's going to be cytochrome C related. So typically red light um, has been the most effective. But again, sound, some people have used that. Uh, magnetic stimulation, there's a phenomenon called MERT, M-E-R-T, that has been quite successful. Um, so there are multiple ways, and find the one that you like. Find the one that, you know, that's the good news. You have your choice. Find the one that really is enjoyable to you, that's not too stressful for you, uh, and then start to see improvements. Uh, and the one that really, you know, as you start seeing improvements in your own cognition, you can really focus on whatever one has worked best for you. And at the beginning, try a couple of different things. Uh, for, the, for the light stimulation, there's something called V-Light, there's something called Neuronic, which a lot of people like, uh, and there are others. Um, check out what you like and even, uh, you know, try a friend's uh, and see what is working best for you. Great. It sounds like, you know, experiment, see what brings you joy and like what lights you up that doesn't sound too or doesn't feel stressful. Now, for right. those things like Sudoku and crossword puzzles and playing an instrument, how often should we be doing this in order to receive the benefits of this brain stimulation? Yeah, you know, that's been looked at uh, by the Brain <laughs> HQ researchers. And they found three to five times per week was a good idea. Now, is that the same? I know, you know, your piano teacher may tell you to practice every single day. Uh, so, and that's not going to hurt you. But you want to do it at least three to five times per week. Okay. And is that 20 minutes, 45? Yeah. Does that even matter? Yeah. You want to get about 30 minutes in. And again, Brain HQ, they recommend 30 minutes at least three times a week. If you're going to do more like five or six times a week, you can dial that back to 20 minutes or so. And some of these, you know, can be quite challenging. So again, don't let it stress you out. Uh, cut back a little if that bothers you and then slowly work up to it. In the case of Brain HQ, they actually have it programmed in. So if you're having trouble with a specific area, it will slowly go down. So be patient. Um, it'll uh, it'll dial back a little bit uh, and, and you know, it will help you. And I, th I find it also helpful to see if people are improving. Well, how are they doing on their Brain HQ, for example? Are they showing continued improvement? It really gives you a good handle on whether you're going in the right direction. If something has been missed, 
Um, if you're missing exposure, for example, to molds and mycotoxins, if you're, expi- uh, if you're missing some ongoing inflammation, things like that, um, then you won't see people get better. And fortunately, in the trial that we published, all of the people actually improved their brain HQ score. So everybody got in there and tried it, and everybody could, you could actually see them improve. And interestingly, the ones who did it more often uh, tended to improve more. Makes sense. Um, yeah, it sounds like Brain HQ is a, an approachable uh, program that we can all do to to assess where our brain's at. Now, I've heard now, about let this. Me ask one, if I could yeah. just add one other thing here, Nikki, before we go on, because I think this is an important point. One of the things that critics have said is when you do something like a Brain HQ, it makes you better at Brain HQ, but does it really help you with your life? Does it help you things outside? So there have been some studies that suggested that when you focus on a specific modality, yes, you get better on that. Your brain really focuses on that, but it's not helping you for outside. There are other studies that have shown that, no, you're actually getting some improvement. For example, improvements in processing speed, which are very important. Improvements in spatial and verbal memory, really important. So what I would say, again, as you try a couple of things, then see what it does for things outside that. See how it's doing for your, uh, your general life. One of the things that I hear the most often when people come in with cognitive complaints and then improve, their spouses or significant others will say they're just more engaged. They're more mm-hmm. interactive. They're quicker. They're, uh, they're realizing where they are uh, you know, with, the, the, with other people. Uh, and and more responsive. And I think that's an important thing. Um, It really does change your life, and it's part of improving your cognition. So see how you feel, and also see how your significant other feels. I like that. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I think it's, you know, increasing your awareness outside of the game, outside of, you know, this one area and look at other facets of your life. And if your awareness isn't so heightened, maybe ask, you know, a loved one, have you noticed a difference? So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. And kind Mm -hmm. of in terms of connecting with others, how does social life play, you know, a role in keeping our brains active? Yeah, that's such a good point. Now, to be fair, there are introverts and extroverts, and some people just like to do more things with small groups or by themselves and, you know, do tremendous, very, very well that way and may write novels and do all sorts of amazing things. Other people like to be more with groups uh, and, and interactive. And if you like that, that's definitely helpful. So social interactions, that's come up again and again and again on research. So a good idea. But again, it's not for everyone. So again, figure out what's best for you. I know my own wife and I, when we go to parties or events, we have different uh, feelings about how long to stay and how to approach that and all these sorts of things. And I think that's very typical for couples. So again, find out if it's stressful for you to be with many, many people, then, you know, then dial it back. Um, on the other hand, if you find joy in that, then yeah, get out and about because that has come up again and again as something that is stimulating um, and that is positive for many, many people and supports cognition as they find people who uh, get away from that. It's a little bit like a sedentary lifestyle. Not exercising is also not exercising your social interactions. There's some similarity there. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think it's like a little bit, you know, what I'm hearing is you're challenging yourself to get yourself out of your comfort zone, but you still want it to make sure it gives you joy. It's not so stressful. And, you know, what about having a sense of purpose or, you know, things through work, volunteering, community involvement? Does that help keep our minds sharp? Absolutely. And not only that, it's been shown recently that this is critical for longevity. Uh, having a purpose definitely supports greater longevity. So health span and lifespan and brain span. So yes, absolutely. And I think that, you know, we all feel that when we are focused on something, wow, this is exciting. I'm going to get this done. Whatever that next, you know, whatever that next goal is, uh, really helpful for keeping you sharp because, you know, you're, you're, thinking about it. You're you're in your mind. You are doing calculations. Now, what if we do this? What if we do that? How about this? How about that? You're then trying the next thing. You're getting input. So you are getting both, you know, on the sensory side, on the analytical side, um, you are getting stimulation, which again is part. And again, getting stimulation and then relaxing, getting that, getting good sleep, getting time, whether it's meditation, turning off all that outside interference 
is equally important. Doing those, you know, we really have uh, a, a kind of modal uh, setup in our bodies. We're set up for moving and then sleeping and relaxing, you know, going and then stopping. The, the, this is the way to, it's that constant, just like with the stress, the constant is bad, whereas a little bit of stress and then relaxation actually quite supportive for your cognition. You know, it just hit me when you were explaining that, that my trainers for my dogs, they always talk about not just the physical stimulation, but the mental stimulation, even for dogs. Right. And so putting them in the car so they can look around, so this makes perfect sense. It's not just the physical stimulation that's going to wear them out or bring them to an equilibrium or balance, but you really want to tap into both of those forms of stimulation. So it's just interesting how it's not just for humans as well. Um, you know, it's a good point. And actually, there's been a lot of work on dog dementia. Uh, and unfortunately, dogs have the same problem uh, as they get a little older. Um, they are. And there's, uh, there's a, a nice uh, literature on this now uh, looking at how do you diagnose dementia in dogs. You know, they do tend mm. to get lost. They, they don't really know which way to go. They, they uh, have problems with interaction. They'll have behavioral changes as well. They get, may get a little more snippy as they get older. Um, and so, interestingly, there are better and better approaches to improve that uh, for dogs as well. So, yeah, something to think about for your pets. Yeah, or order a clarinet for your dogs next time. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, I know we've talked about a variety of hobbies and activities, you know, playing an instrument, doing games. Are there any other mm -hmm. forms of hobbies or activities that come to mind um, just as suggestions for individuals to try out? Yeah, you know, just about anything. Take up pickleball, um, get some tennis lessons, uh, you know, get out there uh, and throw a ball around. Um, you know, do uh, you don't have to do a, 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 tri a triathlon, um, but do a little bit of each part of that. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the main thing, you know, the, the, the trick with exercise is to push yourself a little bit, but not too hard. It's turning out that, uh, you know, if you're going through marathons, as, as great as that sounds, and there are a lot of marathon runners who've have, have wonderful cardiovascular benefits, um, it's actually a little beyond what most of us were meant to do and so that you tend to break down knees and joints and things like that. So again, get a little bit of stress, but not so much that you're breaking, uh, you know, that you're actually hurting your skeletal and you're, you know, giving yourself arthritis and things like that. Uh, so yeah, there are all sorts of things. And, you know, of course, uh, I mentioned pickleball because it's really picking up around, you know, around the country, it and around is. the world. People are into it. Uh, and I think it's also brought some people back to tennis as well. Uh, and again, you know, just so many things out there. Uh, you know, some of our friends like to get out and jog together on the weekends, things like that. Great, you know, hills to climb. Uh, you know, so many things, so much beauty out there. And of course, since the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's been clear to all of us, we need to get outdoors. And part of the problem with cognition is being indoors too much because you do get exposed to different things indoors. There are usually, unless you live in an area, in an area of great air pollution, you're usually gonna have less toxic exposure outdoors, less mycotoxin exposure for sure. Uh, one of the big issues has been ducts and things like that and the stuff that people find when they clean out ducts. There was a patient a few years ago for Dr. Hathaway who presented actually with Lewy body dementia. And it turned out in his ducts had both uh, mold and unfortunately uh, rat droppings and things like that. And just getting rid of all that improved his cognition dramatically. So things like this, you know, we're, we're all living indoors in toxic spaces often, and we weren't really meant to do that. So get, just getting outdoors, um, getting your heart rate up, that's another important point. Uh, and this is why I like EWAT, this exercise with oxygen therapy. You, you're, you know, you've got this ability to perfuse this remarkable 500 trillion synapses. And when we're, you know, kind of hitting on not all cylinders, we're indoors, we're exposed to a little bit of toxic environment, our blood flow isn't great, our oxygenation isn't great, we're really not supporting those synapses. And so your brain just responds by saying, okay, well, you can support a slightly smaller set of synapses. Well, if you get out, get the, get, get the good breathing out there, get, you know, get your oxygen uh, up and do the right things, you know, you, you get some, you know, aerobic exercise, you are going to support those far reaches, and you're going to literally support a larger, more functional brain. 
Well, and it sounds like a win, win, win. If you go outside, you play pickleball with friends, you're getting the sunshine, you're getting the physical stimulation, the mental, the social stimulation. So next time you're out here, we're joining pickleball team. (laughs) Sounds like a great idea. I like it. Yeah. Oh, that'd be fun. So kind of on the flip side, I feel like our brains are always plugged in. We are stimulated, but seems to be more on you know, a little bit too far in one direction, whether it's our phones, our computers, watching TV, or doing all of that simultaneously. Is there such thing as overstimulating or bad types of brain stimulation? That's a good point. Um, And many of us have that. We're bombarded with social media. We're bombarded with various things on television and on, you know, podcasts and all these sorts of things. So yes, again, we're made as human organisms to have peak performance and then relaxation. Now, it's interesting. You look at, let's look at bottlenose dolphins. They have to have a way to sleep, but how are you going to sleep if you've got to come up for air, right? So what they have, they've developed a a strategy where they put half the brain to sleep at once. So you put half the brain to sleep, you can still get your oxygen, then you put the other half of the brain to sleep. Luckily, we don't have to do that, but we can now calm down whether it's meditation, making sure you get uh, you know seven to eight hours of sleep a night, relaxation. I you know I just got back from uh, from presenting at a meeting, and it was really striking to me uh, the one day when I didn't do things right, heart rate variability was worse. Mm-hmm. Trying to go to sleep at night, lousy sleep. My heart rate during the sleep was higher. We uh, really kind of stim- overstimulated. So you can see the difference very clearly, and I could you can check it on your whatever you like to use, Apple Watch or a ring or whatever, or just check your pulse. Um, You can see differences. It really does make a difference. And what's turning out is when we are young, we're compensating for all these things, but we're kind of breaking down doing it. And it's part of what is associated with the changes of aging. So as we're getting older, we're not so good at compensating. It's stressful to us. And so it really does help to, you know, to have these downtimes, these meditation, yoga, whatever it is, you know, get your mind free and get away from all this uh, for a little while. Yeah. So it sounds like giving yourself that challenge and that boost to stimulate, but then also plenty enough or enough time to be able to relax and calm the body. Now, what about when it comes to supplements? Are there any sort of brain supplements that will support this brain stimulation? Yeah. So again, you're thinking about two different things here. For the calming side, things like rhodiola or ashwagandha, uh, or the calm uh, a product that you're that you're going to come out with. These are all things that can be very, very helpful for relaxation. Um, and then the stimulation, it's really supporting. There are some focus products, um, and there it's about stimulation. And for example, uh, with you want things that that have uh, that will increase your BDNF again, which supports that synaptic, uh, the synaptic formation. Uh, and of course, NeuroQ has the whole coffee fruit extract that increases BDNF. Exercise, another good way to, to increase your BDNF. So these things again can work together to give you that good performance to keep optimizing your performance. And that's another thing we don't tend to think about. It's like, well, it's good enough. Well, we, it's, it's good to, have some have some extras and one of the things that's been found is people who had support who did who went for example uh, longer in school who did more um, in training tend to develop dementia later so they essentially have a reserve that helps them so what we're all trying to do with this stimulation with this exercise with, with all these things is to enhance that reserve. We are enhancing our own reserve so that we get the best outcomes. We're getting the same thing as if you have three PhDs, you're going to continue to have extra reserve. The, you know, the more that you are that you do that, the right things. And then again, to, to get in that part. Now, I know uh, when I was training, the big problem was we'd have to stay up two and three nights in a row. So you'd be up 24, 48, even sometimes 72 hours, just horrible. And I realized, you know, how bad that was for my health and my brain uh, as an intern. Um, Fortunately, now we know much more about what to do and what not to do. So you can really set up a program that supports your cognition and helps you not only for now, but for the future. 
Well, and it, this reminds me of a quote I've heard before is you don't use it, you lose it. And I can also see on the flip side, you abuse it, you lose it. And so it's finding that balance of using, you know, and practicing brain stimulation without overdoing it. Um, you know, and, and like you mentioned, NeuroQ is going to be coming out with Calm Focus soon, which is going to be such a phenomenal formula to calm the brain so that it can yeah. actually do its proper functioning. And even Life Seasons has a formula like Adrenal Tea, which contains the rhodiola and the ashwagandha and some just other helpful B vitamins that are going to be nourishing to the brain. So there's so much available and out there. And, you know, Dr. Bredesen, we just appreciate your wisdom and your insight and this is always such a fascinating conversation that I know I could spend hours talking about. I look forward to our next discussion, part six, on the role of stress and brain health. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Bredesen, for coming. Yep. Let's all continue to improve our brain health and avoid cognitive decline. Great to talk to you, Nikki. Fantastic. See you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. For those of you who are interested in our continued conversation and the next step of the Bredesen 7 protocol, follow us for updates on our next episode. Now remember, taking daily supplements also helps protect our long-term brain health. It provides those key ingredients to support memory and thinking, especially if you suffer from a specific nutritional deficiency that affects your cognitive health. Visit NeuroQ.com to get your bottle of NeuroQ Memory and Focus, clinically shown to improve memory, boost focus, enhance mental clarity, and increase brain speed. NeuroQ Memory and Focus is also available at thousands of stores across the United States, including Sprouts, Air One, Whole Foods, Natural Grocers, Fresh Time Market, Mother's Market Kitchen, and Clark's Nutrition. Until next